Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over the point-and-click adventure game starring Indiana Jones. Dave's obsession! Dave's obsession of the moment! Ah, who doesn't love the odd-numbered Indiana Jones movies? Nazis! That's who! And probably some perfectly nice people who don't share my taste in cinema. My point is, George and Steve's fan film based on the cheesy old serials of their childhood became a very popular franchise, and like every popular franchise, especially when George is involved, there's gonna be merchandising! And one form of merchandising is tie-in video games. Now, you probably remember there were quite a few console games based on the Indiana Jones movies, but that's not what I'm here to discuss. I'm here to discuss the PC games. Because, really, who wants to wait around to use the Nintendo until their mom's done watching Young Riders? Real men wait around to use the computer until their dad's done writing his dissertation. Once upon a time, the name LucasArts actually meant something. And the name wasn't LucasArts, it was Lucasfilm Games. Film Games! Just like Radio Books or Instagram Vaudeville! And while they dabbled in many genres early on, where they truly excelled was the point-and-click adventure games. They released many beloved original games, some of which launched their own franchises, but of course they also had to partake in that merchandising thing. Starting off with the major movie adaptation, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, a game that finally lets you play as Han Solo and James Bond at the same time! Adventure games as a genre are often accused of having a lack of replayability. You're just solving puzzles to get to the end of the story, and once you've gotten to the end, you know the solutions to the puzzle, so there's no more challenge, so why bother replaying? Now, I personally don't entirely subscribe to that philosophy. I mean, I rewatch movies that I've seen, even though they're exactly the same each time, so why shouldn't I replay a game every now and then, regardless of the lack of variety? But that said, the accusers also aren't entirely wrong. There are many adventure games that follow a very rigid path. Each step in every puzzle has to be completed in exactly the right order, and if they let you stray from the path at all, it's just to kill you off. But the Indiana Jones games are different. Here we have multiple paths, multiple detours, and puzzles with multiple solutions. Including punching. Punching is a possible solution. Violence in an adventure game? Yeah, the violent path is sometimes an option in the genre. Notably in a certain competing adventure game franchise that also starred a protagonist known for his headwear. But that franchise provided killing as a last resort. At least the real entries in that franchise did. You were rewarded more for taking the non-violent path. Now with Indy, it's hard to claim that it rewards or punishes you for choosing violence or avoiding violence. But it does alter the game. There are some things you can't do once you start fighting, and there are some things you can only do if you fight everybody. Of course, if you try to fight everybody, you might could die. Colonel, I didn't think you could die in LucasArts Adventure Games. Well, maybe they're trying something different. Well, you still can't die in the adventure game parts of LucasArts Adventure Games. You only die in fights in both of these games, not as the result of bad puzzle decisions. At least not until the very end. But enough about fighting around the world. What's all this nonsense about multiple solutions? Am I implying that watching the movie isn't a sufficient walkthrough to completing the game? Well, of course, as with any game based on a movie, some sequences of the film are expanded upon severely. You know, simple walks down hallways become complicated mazes. While other scenes are condensed severely. Like, the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword doesn't show up in the game at all. Hell, Sala doesn't show up in the game at all. So, there's one area where the ride is the superior spin-off. But there are some sequences in the film adapted directly into the game. And in these cases, you can just do what the characters did in the movie. But you don't always have to. This is demonstrated early on when they recreate this scene. Irene, put everybody's name on the list in order to their lives. Come on, let's go. And I'll see each and every one of them in turn. Yeah, you can tell the students to wait and then climb out the window just like Indy does. But if you've had the proper conversation with Marcus before you entered your office, he'll tell you about another professor you can stick the students on. Neither outcome really affects much of anything, but it is an early clue about the game's versatility. Later on in the game, when the Nazis demand the diary from Indy, you can follow the movie here, give them the diary, ride to Berlin, recover the diary, and get it signed by Ol Adolf. Or you can have Adolf sign your travel pass, which will help ease your path later. 
Or, or, you can give the Nazis a fake Grail Diary and not even have to go to Berlin at all, which drastically shortens the game. It's kind of insane to think of how many sequences they programmed here and then deliberately ensured that some people who complete the game would never have to actually see those sequences. And that's just the tip of the replayability iceberg. Hell, even at the last second, after you've basically won, there are still options. Like, do you let Elsa die or save her? Saving Elsa is actually an option. Not to mention there are some pieces of the game that are randomly generated and change from play to play. Like, which grail is actually the correct one? There are a lot of cups of carpenters around here. So the game proved successful and a sequel was made. But since there wasn't another movie coming out in the near future, they instead opted to make Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, a new game with a new story. And a new voice cast starring Doug Lee as Indy. He sounds about as close to Harrison Ford as the Free Willy animated cast sounded to the movie cast. All right, Jones, how are you going to find that statue and all this junk? I think you are a truth talker. I looked it up, they're not the same actor. Still, while it's not a dead-on imitation, I think Lee's voice works for Indy. He's got that combination of tough and weary, adventurous and cynical that helps to capture at least the basic most version of the character. But if you're not a fan of his interpretation, hey, you can play with just subtitles and no voices. Fate of Atlantis starts off fun and quirky with this neat little cold open, interactive opening credit sequence deal. It's slapstick and not particularly involved gameplay, but it's a fun way to combine the mechanics of the game with a cinematic opening. After that, unlike Last Crusade, the first act of Fate of Atlantis is fairly linear. Indy goes to New York, meets up with Sophia Hapgood, they globetrot for a bit until they return to the university to find the lost dialogue of Plato, and then the adventure begins proper. And the adventure itself is fairly linear, without all that much freedom of choice throughout the game. But there is one crucial moment of choice before that, a moment which essentially splits the game into three separate games. Indy is about to go on his mission, Sophia offers to come along, and you can either accept her help, mention action, or mention thinking. And apparently Indy's incapable of thinking if Sophia's there. That seems kind of sexist against every gender. This choice determines whether you are choosing the team path, where Sophia factors into the gameplay, the fist path, where the puzzles are minimalized in favor of fight sequences, or the wits path, which does not have John Moe, but it features more complex adventure game puzzles. So basically, what Indy says here actually determines what he's going to encounter along the way. I wish I could just declare what kind of a journey I'm going to have today. Today, I'm only going to encounter short lines. So you're off on whichever of the three games you chose. And while they all use the same basic settings and have some puzzle crossover, they truly are three different games. They have completely separate pacing from each other. A side character may be an ally in one path and an enemy in another. And I think it's worth playing through both the wits and the team path to see what both have to offer. I'm less crazy about the fists path since I don't find the fighting mechanics particularly fun and most of the good stuff in it shows up in some form in one of the other two paths. But the puzzles are simplified, so it could be worth doing if you like button mashing and just want to get through the game without scratching your head at crazy adventure game logic. Eventually the paths converge, but there are still a few minor alternate endings depending on how you handle things when you get to Atlantis. So while it doesn't have quite the mind-blowingly intricate variety that Last Crusade does, Fate of Atlantis is still a lot of fun. As far as a lot of people are concerned, it's the true fourth Indiana Jones story. The Indiana Jones point-and-click adventure games expand the boundaries of the film's mythology while also pushing the limits of their gaming genre. And that's what makes them absolute classics, and they are still fun to play today. So check them out if you get a chance, and until next time, this is Dave, signing off.